All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and pray. We'll get started. Uh, I have to finish up everything today, and still have time for a preview of what's coming up. So let's go ahead and begin with the word of prayer, and we'll get started. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your kindness, Lord, uh, to your people, Lord, throughout all the ages. Lord, thank you for your covenant faithfulness, Lord. Be with us today, Lord, um, as we uh, discuss uh, the recipients of baptism, Lord, uh, and particularly uh, children, Lord, how you've included them uh, into, uh, into your covenant, Lord, as part of your covenant people, Lord. Um, Lord, help me to be gracious, Lord, in dealing with it, Lord. Uh, we understand that uh, not all Christians agree on this topic, Lord. Uh, it's certainly one uh, that doesn't have to uh, divide us from being brothers and sisters in Christ, but yet there are real uh, passionate um, uh, people on both sides of the issue, Lord. Uh, help us to deal with, with this today with grace, Lord, uh, but yet with uh, with truth and, and, and with conviction, Lord, uh, that we are really and truly hearing you speak uh, from your word on this issue. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so uh, well, we're at the end and we're at the most contentious uh, and debated uh, part of our uh, study on covenants. Uh, we have been talking about baptism last week. We, we started that. Today we're going to finish up with baptism and we are going to particularly talk about the recipients of baptism. Now, I have not at all covered uh, the mode uh, of baptism, I, I've decided just not to cover uh, that topic. That can be for uh, another study. But we're going to be looking at the recipients of baptism. And we all, pretty much all traditions can all already agree that adults uh, can be uh, and should be recipients of baptism. But the issue uh, that we're coming to today is children. Where do they belong uh, in the covenant? And the issue that we're going to be looking at is theologically called pedo Baptism, okay, from the, the Greek word pedo for uh, meaning children, right? We get the word pedagogy uh, from there. Okay, now this doctrine, it was not so divisive in the Protestant Reformation uh, as the Lord's Supper was, but it, today there is a great evangelical, if we can still use that word, the same uh, divide uh, between lots of well meaning Christians, right? We have the Baptist tradition, I guess we could, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just call it that, and that, that branches out in lots of different ways and pretty much every other Protestant tradition uh, that are divided on this issue. Now, the questions that we kind of want to ask are, why did many of the reformers keep the practice of infant baptism? Okay, you know, the radical reformers, the Anabaptists, they felt that the tradition of Rome, uh, that it was still, that the reformers didn't go far enough in ridding themselves of, of Roman Catholicism. Okay, and so that was one of the issues, like, no, that's still a Roman Catholic practice. We, do, we should just get rid of it all. And only believers, adult converts, are the ones who should be baptized. All right, so to, you know, to this day, it's not uncommon to hear caricatures against Protestant pedo baptists as continuing in Roman Catholicism in some form or another uh, because of this issue. So there's mis much, uh, there is much misunderstanding about why Presbyterians and Reformed Christians baptize their children because we kind of get lumped into this baptismal regeneration group. Basically, they, they mistakenly think that we think that just because we baptize infants that we, we think or we believe that they become regenerate right on the spot, okay, or that uh, somehow their salvation is therefore guaranteed simply because they receive <coughs> baptism. So uh, in this final portion of the doctrine of baptism, I want to explain the grounds for a reformed and covenantal view of infant baptism as well as deal with some of these objections, all right? So that's pretty much going to lay out our path. Let's make a positive case for infant baptism, and then let's handle some of the objections. Now, historically, uh, Roman Catholics practiced infant baptism because it was the means by which regeneration was effected and justifying grace was infused into the infant, okay? And that included uh, the removal of the effects of original sin. So basically, you needed to become baptized to wipe away all your sins so that you could be forgiven. And as you know, if you were an infant or a child, in case you happened to die, you had no stain of sin on you and you could go straight into heaven, okay? That was very, uh, very important in the Middle Ages when death was, uh, you know, the mortality rate among infants was a lot higher than it is today. Now, um, Lutherans oscillated between a, uh, what we called like the faith of another, uh, whether it was the faith of the church or the faith of the parents, 
uh, as, uh, as, what, uh, as what brought about regeneration for the child, or a fetus infantium, that is an infant faith that God was able to grant to the child through the sacrament itself, that would then affect the regeneration of the child in baptism. Okay, Lutherans were quick to say that it was not the sacrament itself that brought regeneration. So they have a lot of you know, qualifiers in, in, in their view. But all of these positions run into problems when trying to ground, when trying to ground these, you know, these answers biblically. Okay, so where does the Bible speak of infant faith? Where does the Bible speak of, you know, uh, an infant or, or uh, the faith of somebody else counting as yours? You know, those are some of the issues that come up. For the Reformed, according to Herman Bovink in his, in his book on uh, Reformed Dogmatics, he says this. He says, the covenant was the sure scriptural objective ground upon which all the Reformed, together and without distinction, based the right to infant baptism. They had no other deeper or more solid ground. So um, in one sense, okay, it's very possible that this entire Sunday School series could have just been building you up to this moment for infant baptism, okay? Because you can't explain infant baptism apart from the covenants, all right? You, it, it's, you just can't. I mean, you can try to ground it, you know, in a sense like, you know, like Luther did in, in, in a fetus infantium or, or an alien faith. But you can't ground it scripturally. So the covenants are very, very important for understanding why we believe uh, infants and uh, children should uh, have a right to baptism. So let me give some transparency here, okay? Uh, some people attempt to argue for infant baptism on the grounds that households were baptized at time in the New Testament, okay? That is true, right? Uh, the Greek word for household, oikos, right? That's why Presbyterians love oikos, you know, yogurt. We go get that at H-E-B, okay? Because it's household yogurt, okay? A um, <laughs> little humor there, okay? It, now, it is, tr it is true, okay? I mean, there were household baptisms, but what is missing from those texts is the explicit mention of children, Okay, yes, if children were present in the household and households were baptized, then children would have necessarily been included. But you can see just arguing, well, households were baptized, there's still not the explicit evidence, right? Well, does that mean that, you know, there was, uh, uh, you know, an infant there? Was there a newborn there? Well, the text doesn't say. Okay, so, you know, we're not entirely sure on that. So, you know, just being transparent on these arguments. Uh, others try to argue that since Jesus said, let the children come to me, that this would not forbid them from receiving baptism. However, this verse is not about baptism per se, but, upon, but about the dependence upon God for, the reception, or for reception into the kingdom that is comparable to how a child trusts their own parents to give them what they need. So, uh, in, in many ways, these arguments really don't find solid ground because they are essentially arguments that do not have a covenantal foundation to them yet, okay? They don't have it yet. But the point that I want to make is that there are some people who try to argue for infant baptism based on the New Testament alone, okay? And that is really, really hard to do. It, it's, it's extremely difficult to do, and just by the questions that I'm raising from the text, I mean, you can see, okay, well, show me where an infant was. You know, well, uh, uh-oh, let the children come to me. Well, it doesn't necessarily say baptism, you know. I'm going to hold on on questions and stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're going to hold on that. So uh, I, I think it should be admitted up front that arguments for infant baptism that begin with the New Testament do not find very much solid footing. Likewise, it needs to be said that arguments against infant baptism that begin with the New Testament do not do justice to the redemptive history and all of God's covenantal revelation concerning his will for redemption and the continuation of the covenant from generation to generation. So again, this is why this study on covenants has been so important because we want to see what the whole Bible has to say about this topic and not just half of the Bible or really even you know, a third or 25% of the Bible. We want to see what all of scripture has to say about children and their inclusion into the covenant community. So why do Reformed Protestants and Presbyterians in particular baptize the children of believing parents. Well, let's do some apologetic work immediately and say that this is not because we believe that baptism saves the child, okay? The, the very act of receiving water baptism is not what saves them. That's not what we're arguing, okay? 
Reformed teaching is clear that justification comes through faith alone. We've made that abundantly clear throughout this whole study. Reformed teaching further believes that regeneration precedes faith. So hence, the faith to believe is something that God gives through regeneration, but it is not something that we see in the Bible that says has to or necessarily comes through the reception of baptism. Okay, the water simply remains water. Nothing, you know, it doesn't uh, transfigure into anything else. It doesn't transubstantiate, nothing like that. It, it's still water, okay? Uh, there's no special waters that are contained in it that somehow become necessary for salvation, okay? So those are the things that we are not saying. We need to be clear about those, all right? So why do we baptize our children, all right? Is it because their salvation will be guaranteed by, in a sense, just by receiving the covenant sign? Are we saying that simply because a child is baptized that therefore salvation is guaranteed? And again, no. The Westminster Confession says that the grace signified in baptism is conferred to the elect only and only in God's appointed time. So God does not promise. We don't find this promise in the Bible. God does not promise that every child of every believer is elect. We don't see that explicit promise, okay? There are those who, par who partook of the sacraments in the Old Testament and perished because they did not, by faith, lay hold of the promises. You get that from Hebrews chapter 3. I mean, you know, there come the Israelites. They're coming out of Egypt, right? They're circumcised. They partook of, you know, the, the Passover meal. They get into the desert, and what happens? They have all the covenant signs. And what happens? They perish, Hebrews says, because they did not have faith, okay? So... Um, you know, many, many circumcised Israelites perished, uh, even in the New Testament, right? Judas himself, you know, partaking of the sacraments, yet what? He perished, okay? So what are we saying, okay? We are saying this, that the baptism of infants, like the baptism of adults, okay, is a sign and seal of the covenant promises of God that are given through faith, Okay? The baptism of infants, like the baptism of adults. This is important, okay, because I'm not going to lay down two different versions of baptism, that one's for adults and one is for children. It's the same significance. It's the same sign and the same seal, okay, like the baptism of adults is a sign and seal of the covenant promises of God that are given through faith. Theologian R.C. Sproul, he says, baptism is not a sign of the child's faith. It is a sign of what the child will receive by faith. It is a sign of God's promise, which is received by faith. So in this manner, both the child and the adult are baptized on the same covenantal grounds. All right? The, the, there's the, the only difference between the baptism of adults and children in the Reform view is that the adults who are baptized, they come into the covenant community as outsiders. They're fresh. They, they have, you know, in, in a sense, uh, they have uh, no dealings at all with the Christian church for the most part. Okay? They're a brand new convert, but we baptize them because they're brought into covenant. Okay? They're brought into the covenant community. They're brought in as outsiders. Okay? And uh, so their confession of faith and conversion must be expressed prior to their baptism. The children of believers, on the other hand, are born into the covenant community, and therefore they have a right to the promises given in the sign of the covenant. Both are baptized on the same grounds of the covenant, and we don't have one, you know, in a sense being baptized because... He's professed his faith. He's baptized because he's brought into the covenant. Why is a child baptized? Because they're brought into the covenant. Okay? So the key to understanding why children continue to receive the sign of the covenant is the unity of the covenant of grace given through Abraham and fulfilled through Jesus Christ in the new covenant. In Genesis 17, when God first gave the sign of the covenant of grace to Abraham, he established the covenant not with Abraham alone, but with his offspring after him as well. And so we listen to God again, right? Uh, this is in Genesis 17, uh, verses 5 through 8. It says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And in verse 12, 
of Genesis 17, it also makes a mention that all those Abraham who you bring into your household, if you buy a slave, they're also going to receive the sign, okay? So you, your children, and anybody else that comes in, all right? So God has explicitly brought not only Abraham, but his descendants as well. Note that this covenant, which we have established in prior lessons as the covenant of grace that God will pursue, is an everlasting covenant covenant. That's important. God is not making a temporary covenant with Abraham and saying, Abraham, this covenant and, and the, the covenant sign are going to be good only up until, and then he starts to date. God doesn't do that. He says, this is an everlasting covenant. This is the one that I am pursuing. Okay. It is the covenant that God is pursuing as part of his one plan of salvation. The same covenant promises of a people, a place, and the presence of God from the Abrahamic covenant are the same promises contained in the new covenant. The new covenant is not a completely new plan of salvation, as we've argued, but it is a new promise revealed as part of the same covenant of grace that will now guarantee the reception of the same promises that were made to Abraham. Okay, let's see, I have some extra notes here. Um, no, we don't need those, okay? Now, because God has made this covenant of grace with Abraham as an everlasting covenant, and because this covenant has included the offspring of those in the covenant community beginning with Abraham, okay, administering the sign and the seal of the same covenant of grace in the new covenant era is simply the natural demonstration of the continuation of the same promises made to Abraham that are still held out, okay? They're still held out now through Jesus Christ, Abraham's offspring. We, we, uh, uh, one place to see this from Galatians 3.16. And in fact, in all Galatians 3, when we read this in our study, one of the things that was very in intriguing, I think, is that Abraham heard, it says, the same gospel that Paul was preaching. It was a really interesting argument, right? And Paul is saying he has to argue that to the Galatians to say that you're justified by faith alone. And the way you receive the Spirit is through faith alone, not through any of your works. And when he starts reasoning out why, he says, hey, Abraham got it through faith alone. And if Abraham, Abraham heard this same gospel that you guys are getting, and he was justified by faith alone, what do you think that means for you guys? That you guys are also justified by faith alone the same way that Abraham was. Okay? So three questions that we kind of want to ask, in a sense, to help us, uh, to help us understand uh, why we continue to include infants in the new covenant. And these are from uh, Dr. Ligon Duncan's class, his, uh, his lecture series on covenants. Uh, it, that is available online on iTunes. Okay? Uh, he has three questions. The first one is this. Is baptism a covenant sign? Okay, I won't answer them yet. I think the answers are somewhat obvious for us at this point. Okay? But these are the questions that he, he tries to direct people to to help them understand. Is baptism a covenant sign? Okay, that's the first question. Second question. Are the children of believing parents part of the community of the covenant of grace under the new covenant like they were under the old covenant? Okay, now here's, this is one of the stickler parts, right? This is the one that takes a lot of explanation, okay? Because this one starts to get into issues of the church, ecclesiology. What is the church? And sometimes, you know, starting from these questions is going to lead you down a different path than starting from another question that I, I think the Baptists start with, what is the church? Starting from that question took them, I, I think, personally, just down another path, okay? But uh, the second question, are the children of believing parents part of the community of the covenant of grace under the new covenant like they were under the old covenant? Okay, and question number three, if God gave promises as, and a sign to believers and their children in the old covenant, sh should we give the sign of the promises that he gives to believers and their children in the new covenant. Okay, there's question number three. If God gave promises and a sign to believers and their children in the old covenant, should we continue to give the sign of the promises that he gives to believers and their children in the new covenant? Okay, so let's kind of start to answer some of those. Okay, is baptism a covenant sign? We argued that last week, and I think we can, everybody answers, you know, straight across the board, Yes, yes, it is a covenant sign, okay? Now, we've argued in previous studies that circumcision was a sign of the gospel, 
Okay, it was a spiritual sign. It was not merely a physical sign. It was not merely a national sign. It was not merely an ethnic sign. Okay, uh, it was a spiritual sign given by God to create a spiritual people beginning with Abraham and his descendants to be maintained and passed to all his descendants and anyone else who would want to be brought in to the promises of Abraham. Without this sign, God could bring the covenant curses that are depicted in the cutting off of flesh. Right at the end of Genesis 17, he says it very clearly. Anyone. In your household, Abraham, who does not bear this sign shall be cut off from my people. They have no place in it. They're going to be cut off. And that was the language that the Old Testament starts to use for the covenant curses, right? And when we saw that when we get to Isaiah 53 and we start reading about the suffering servant, what does he experience? It says that he was cut off from the land of the living because the covenant servant is now taking upon himself the covenant curses for the covenant people, okay? We argued that it was males who were circumcised because the promise looked forward to one male seed from the lineage of Abraham. But it also pointed, okay, it's a, it's a multifaceted sign, right? It also pointed to judgment that must take place in order to achieve the blessings. That is, you know, in symbolizing purity, how are you going to get pure? What is required to achieve the purity in a sense that, that circumcision signifies? Well, you've got to cut the flesh. Blood has to be spilled. Judgment has to come. And so it's through judgment that this purification is going to come. Now, it pointed to a purity that was needed as well as a purification that was promised by God. Okay, so it wasn't just a sign like, hey, this is what you need. There's a sign of it. Good luck. Okay, it wasn't just that. It was God's pledge saying, this is what you need. This is also what I'm going to be providing for you. I will provide you know, not only the judgment, but the purity that comes from it. And so hence in Deuteronomy 10, you know, the, the Israelites can be exhorted to seek, in a sense, the circumcision of the heart. He did, you know, Moses tells them, this is what you need to do. You, you need to circumcise your hearts. That's the, that's the problem here. You guys are having trouble obeying God. We're at the edge of the promised land. This other generation has just died out. Part of the problem is that you guys have not circumcised your hearts yet. Okay, but then he tells him just a little bit later in the same book in Deuteronomy 31, 6, he says, one of these days, God is going to circumcise your hearts so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So according to the Old Testament, the physical act of circumcision, it pointed to a greater spiritual reality of the heart. Okay, again, it was not simply a national sign or an ethnic sign. Okay, the physical act of circumcision always pointed away from a physical act, okay, but through a, a physical act, right, to spiritual significance, namely the circumcision of all that is impure in ourselves and the resulting purity that God will give. In short, this was the Old Testament imagery for regeneration, for being born again. The New Testament itself, it concurs that the physical act was not enough to be considered a true or even a faithful member of the covenant. And remember John the Baptist, he comes on the scene, okay, and he starts preaching to Jews. These would have, you know, they would have been circumcised, they would have had the sign. But then he starts telling them, you guys need to be washed, you guys need to be baptized. I'm like, wait, what? But we're circumcised, we have the purity. And, they, and John the Baptist kind of argues, like, no, you know, simply receiving the sign of the covenant doesn't make you in a sense, the receiver of the covenant promises. If you guys aren't going to repent, if you're not going to lay hold of the promises by faith, then they're not for you and you still need to be purified. Okay? And of course, that was a radical message for people who had the, who are already bearing the covenant sign. In uh, Romans 2, 28 and 29, it says that a true Jew is not the one who is merely conformed to the outward sign in circumcision. It says, rather, a Jew is one who is inwardly circumcised and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit. That is the circumcision that was always pointed to was the one that the Holy Spirit would achieve. It was the one that God would give, not the one that we do. Okay. Another important verse uh, worth mentioning is Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. This is an important one okay, for establishing the continuity between circumcision and baptism. Uh, Colossians 2, 11 and 12, it says this, in him also you were circumcised, okay? So you were circumcised. That's an aorist tense in the Greek, okay? That means it's a past tense. It's completed, okay? How were we circumcised? It says, with a circumcision 
made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. A couple of things to note here, okay? Uh, Again, the, the circumcision that was to be looked forward to in the Old Testament, it was not merely a physical one, but one that would be made without Hands, okay, that's a very peculiar phrase. In, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, when, uh, uh, when Daniel is explaining Nebuchadnezzar, uh, his dream that he has, and you know, he sees a statue and then he, he sees a, a pebble that is cut out of a mountain. He says that this rock, this pebble, is one that was cut out without hands. That is, it's not by human means. It's something that God achieves. It's something that God has done. Okay. Now, the Colossians, in their context, they do not seem to be having trouble with Judaizers. Okay? That is, they don't seem to be having the same problem that the Galatians are having with uh, these false teachers teaching justification through faith and works. The issue at, Col- uh, at Colossae seems to be that there are these teachers, these Bible teachers, who are teaching techniques on how to kill the flesh. Okay, and so they're saying, oh, you want to be more spiritual? You want to be more, you know, religious? You, you, want to, you want God to look upon you with a little bit more favor? Well, celebrate this Sabbath. Do this ceremony. You know, do this technique. You know, really squint hard in prayer and God hears you more. You know, if you raise your hands a little bit higher, you know, if you do the carrying TV method or if you do the touchdown method in worship, you know, those get you certain points, Okay. Uh, that seems to be the issue that was going on at Colossae, was how can I become a little bit more spiritual? And uh, Paul, uh, so the way he counters that, uh, Paul seems to be introducing the topic in order to demonstrate that their sinful nature is already put to death through Jesus and not their techniques of religious observance. Okay, Notice that circumcision is accomplished. Again, that's what Paul is pointing them to. He's saying, look, you want to put the flesh to death. You know, that's, a, that's, that's great. That's awesome. But Jesus already did that for you. If you believe in him, Jesus already did that for you. This is kind of what I talked about last week when, we don't, uh, uh, when one guy that I read said that we don't use our baptism enough. We don't look back to it. We kind of just do, yeah, I was baptized, and we forget about it. And that's kind of what Paul is doing here. He's saying, look, look back to the circumcision that took place. Look back to the circumcision that Christ accomplished through his death. Now, how is the sign of circumcision accomplished in believers in Jesus? It is accomplished, it says, by the circumcision of Christ, which is to say that our sinful nature is put to death with Jesus in his own death. I mean, basically, Paul is just kind of repeating Galatians 2.20, for I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives uh, in me. Uh, forgetting the rest of it, but uh, that's the gist of it, right? But So, for those who believe in Jesus, uh, Jesus' death is the death of our old self, and his resurrection is the resurrection of our new self. And all of that is symbolized in baptism. Baptism signifies the washing away of our sin through the death of Christ. It signifies the giving of new life by the Holy Spirit, as well as membership into the household of God. So, Christian baptism... Uh, from this verse, I think we, we can see that it now signifies what old covenant circumcision signified. The point to get from this is the covenantal unity that is exhibited between the covenant of grace of the Old Testament and the new covenant that we see in the New Testament. And so circumcision pointed forward. Okay, This is how you know, I argued last week we want to see the, the, the organic unity. Circumcision pointed forward to the shedding of blood, but baptism looks back at an accomplished work in Christ, in his death at the cross, and now kind of signifies the purity, the resulting purity that comes from that, that is signified in cleansing water, okay? Hence, the realities to come that were depicted in circumcision are depicted as accomplished in the sign of Christian baptism, all right, so, you know, following Paul's, Paul's thought here, because this is a really important verse, he, he tells them, you were circumcised, okay? How? In baptism, all right? That is, in one sense, we should understand that there's a correlation between spiritual circumcision and spiritual baptism, okay? What they signified um, is, is held in organic unity. And understanding this organic connection between circumcision and baptism and the unity of the covenants is, 
it would naturally follow that the sign and seal of the covenant of grace would continue to be administered to children in the new covenant. Okay, and now I'm just going to say, but this is exactly the difference that a covenantal reading of the Bible makes. If you read the Bible um, uh, in, in, in either isolated parts, okay, if you read the Bible starting only from the New Testament and sticking only in the New Testament, you miss a lot of, you miss a lot of what God has already said concerning redemption. Okay, and it's very hard, you know, the, the Bible just kind of becomes this sort of topical book. It becomes sort of like a dictionary to just look up doctrines, okay, rather than as presenting one story, one plan of salvation. You know, it helps to see the unity of the plan, it, God's consistent way of dealing with his people. He has not had different plans of salvation throughout the ages and, you know, a hit or miss. Well, let me try this, let me try that. Oh, let's get, let's, let me chunk that, get rid of that. That was no good. Uh, this is what's going to work now. No, we don't want to understand God in that way either. Okay, that's not how the Bible presents a wise and all-knowing God. God's covenant is an everlasting covenant that has included his pledge to the children of covenant members. And so hence, while those who disagree with the practice of infant baptism, they always ask for an explicit verse that teaches the practice. Now, the presupposition behind that, again, is how the Bible is written and how the Bible is read. Do I read it in just little parts looking for the parts that I need that I, I just take and pick and I you know, plug them in and then put my doctrine together? Okay. Uh, but, you know, they always ask for a specific verse, but Reformed and Covenantal theologians have basically, reading holistically, okay, have asked for the verse in which God has reneged on his eternal covenant, including children, okay? That's what we ask for. Show us where God has changed his plan of salvation. Show us where God has changed the covenant of grace that he started and began under Abraham, so since God saw fit to command that the sign and the seal of the covenant of grace be given to infants of the members of the covenant community as part of the covenant of grace, there is no biblical reason to withdraw God's command that the sign is to be given to children born to members of the covenant community under the same covenant of grace who are members of the household of Abraham. So indeed, I mean, all who are not given the sign of the covenant in the household of Abraham, God has said that he would cut them off since refusing the sign is a refusal of the promises contained in the sign. And this is, of course, where, you know, um, I don't know, you know, where people's convictions are, but there are, you know, some Reformed Presbyterians, you know, who do believe, absolutely, you know, and there's a warrant for it, that it is sinful to not include your children because God has commanded that they be included into the covenant promises. And, of course, that's met with, you know, the equal, uh, equal hostility on the other side, right? Well, if you baptize infants, you're sin sinners. I'm like, oh, you know, and there goes the fight, okay? But, uh, you know, those are the polemics that, they, that you can get into in, in these sort of debates. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I just try to stay away from this debate, uh, but I have gotten into it more since I've been studying it. I'm like, well, let me practice, right? Let me, let me practice my debating uh, over this topic and see how, see how well I understand it. Um, so I mentioned earlier, right? I mentioned earlier that looking for a chapter and verse uh, proof text in the New Testament to validate the practice of infant baptism stands on shaky ground, right? However, when the New Testament is read within the covenantal context of the Old Testament, and you have to remember, the first and only Bible of the New Testament church is the Old Testament, okay? They didn't walk around with little New Testaments with Psalms and Proverbs in the back, Okay, they didn't have those. They, they, they knew the Old Testament. They knew the Old Covenant scriptures. Okay, but once we read the Bible, and I think we understand it within the covenantal context, now a lot of those verses that I mentioned earlier that are a little bit shaky, they find firmer ground in a covenantal context. So now when, you know, when we do hear about household baptisms, I'm honestly, you know, me personally, I'm not worried if infants were there or not. Because the practice is still warranted that households were baptized, that entire households were brought in. That would have included the slaves, okay? Everybody that's a member of that household would have been included. It wouldn't have just been like, well, you know, let me have a, you know, uh, okay, you're in, you're in, uh, tío, tía, you know, you're in, and, uh, you know, and it, it wouldn't have been like that. 
Okay, the, the conversion in the sense of the head of the household usually brought the conversion of the whole household to them. So now when we read words you know, from Peter at Pentecost, they tend to fit quite naturally into a covenantal context, right? When Peter says in Acts 2, 38 and 39, he says, For the promise is for you and for your children. Well, what does that sound like? It sounds like Peter is quoting from Genesis 17, 7 and 12. You and your children. And then he says, you know, and all those who are far off. Well, that's for Genesis 7, 12, right? Or 17, 12. Anybody who's under this household needs to partake of this covenant sign. They need to all repent and be baptized. The promises are held out for you, your children, and everyone who is far off, everyone whom the Lord our God will call to himself. So that is the positive presentation for the case of infant baptism. All right, now I'm going to handle a few objections, okay? Let me go through these quick, okay? Uh, Objection one, the new covenant is meant for believers only. Okay? Hence, since infants cannot believe, they must not be given the sign of the new covenant. Okay? And this is kind of, this is where, where, where I mentioned the presupposition or the starting question is what is the church? Okay? And, and so this is where it leads. Since, uh, since the church is comprised only of believers and children can't believe, therefore children have no warrant to receive the covenant sign. All right? Now, according to Baptist theologians, Jeremiah 31 31 through 34 excludes infants, okay? Now, on what grounds? They say, okay, their justification for this is when it says that in the new covenant that they will all know me, they believe that that points to a regenerate only or a believers only community, okay? However, as mentioned in a previous study on the new covenant, these are not the only words in the Old Testament about the new covenant, Okay, this is, you know, this is the locus classicus, okay, but it's not the only one. Consider the words of Jeremiah, the same prophet, just a chapter down the road, okay, in Jeremiah 32, 38 through 40, Jeremiah says this concerning the new covenant. He says, and they will be, they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. I mean, Jeremiah is not talking about two different covenants here. He's talking about the same everlasting covenant that he just talked about and revealed in Jeremiah 31. Okay, and I will not, that I will not turn away from doing good to them and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. So Jeremiah himself, he reveals that God still makes promises to the children of the covenant that will continue into the new covenant covenant God still promises to be good to the children of believers and still promises not only before they are born but especially once they are born okay there's no place in the new testament that demonstrates that God has reneged on how he deals with families in the new covenant God has not changed dealings with the children of believers rather God he holds out the covenant still so that the recipients of the signs and seals may be assured of God's promises when they believe, okay? Now, here's the catch, okay? Remember, covenant signs are a two-edged sword, okay? Yes, on, on one end, you know, there's the blessings of the covenant that are conveyed, but the signs also contain visions, in a sense, or, or a depiction of the covenant curse should you not believe in the promises that are contained therein. And I mentioned last week uh, that I did happen to get into a... Uh, uh, a baptism debate with uh, Reformed uh, Baptist apologist Dr. James White. This was a couple of years ago. Um, it was on Facebook because obviously I don't have his phone number. We don't chat and stuff like that, okay? Um, but, you know, we got into it and, and, and we started talking about uh, some of the covenant signs. And, 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 you know, the issue kind of came up, well, you know, they don't believe, therefore, you know, they, they can't be baptized. Um, and, and I mentioned, well, what about the baptism of those adults? who, you know, you give them baptism, but then they turn out that they were really unbelievers. And the issue for him, he just said, well, at least I have a clean conscience before God, okay, that I didn't willingly and knowingly give a covenant sign to to a rank unbeliever, okay? Um, So uh, looking back on that, um, the issue or the presupposition in his view on baptism seems to be that baptism is only a one-way sign, that it only points to blessings of the covenant but that it doesn't at all reveal the curses of the covenant. 
You know, we've seen in our studies on the nature of covenant, a covenant is ratified as parties somehow symbolically act out the covenant curse, signifying the penalty for breaking the covenant. I mean, even circumcision itself, it says, you know, you either, you know, you either, um, you know, you either will get a piece of you cut off or all of you will be cut off. It was basically, it was basically the terms, right? You're either going to be purified through judgment or you're going to be judged. Either one of those. Those are the options that come through the sign of circumcision, okay? Baptism carries the same weight, okay? Even in the New Testament, baptism is held out the same. It, it, it signifies purification, it signifies regeneration, but baptism is also, also alluded to as covenant judgment, okay? You, you look at, um, in 1 Peter 3, 20 through 21, uh, the closeness of the sign to the reality can lead Peter to say, right, that baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, but in, in the imagery, and part of his argument is that, look, the waters will either be used to carry you through, in a sense, you know, Christ is our ark. Okay, a little, a little preaching there, right? Okay, either Christ carries you through the judgment waters or the judgment waters bury you. Okay? Likewise, you either die in baptism and rise to life, or if you receive the covenant sign, but don't come to faith. You go down into those baptism waters or you get sprinkled, you know, again, we're not going to talk about the mode at all. But the imagery is that basically you never come up, okay? And to use Lord of the Rings imagery, okay? I have to use it, right? In, in Two Towers in the movie, when uh, Frodo and Sam, they're walking, through, uh, they're walking through the swamp and they look down in the waters and they're like, they're dead people. They're dead faces in the water. In a sense, that's kind of the image that baptism gives so long as you're not in faith but still have the covenant sign is that you've gone into the covenant waters, okay? And there, in a sense, you die. But that's not the full picture of what baptism is. Baptism is also coming up to new life, okay? And that happens through faith. So uh, covenant signs where there was a dual oath function with them. On one side, there was blessings, promise for obedience, okay, that both parties were agreed upon. But on the other side, both sides pledged themselves to death should either side break the stipulations of the covenant. The sign, therefore, it was not intended only to communicate a positive response to grace, but also to communicate what would happen should the grace offered in the sign be forsaken through unbelief, okay? And just as a little excursus, right, um, the, in a sense, in asking that, um, you know, that only people who can have faith uh, can be saved. And since in their argument, right, only people who have faith can be saved, which is true. But then, you know, kind of pushing, well, infants can't have faith, therefore they can't be saved. If you press that, that means that any infant who dies automatically goes to hell. Okay, and Baptists won't go that far. But it's like, how can you not? If you're going to be consistent, you have to press that. Well, who else can't have faith? Right? When you start getting into issues, you know, uh, mentally handicapped and things like that, who else can't have faith? And how far are you going to go with that? All right? So, uh, you know, that's just a little excursus, all right? Uh, objection number two, really fast. The practice of infant baptism is not practiced nor commanded in the New Testament. Now, here's a big one, right? Because if you've all read the New Testament, and if I were to ask any single buddy, any person here, show me in the Bible where God says to baptize children. Can you show it to me? Probably not, right? Well, what else can't you show me? Right? You also can't show me the verse that says, baptize only adult converts. You can't show me the verse. You can, show, you, you, you can uh, see a practice, but there's no explicit command. Well, you know what else you can't show me? The inclusion of women into the Lord's Supper. Anybody thought about that one? You know what else you can't show me? Where it says to explicitly worship on Sunday. You can't show me that verse either, okay? So uh, this is a rather interesting argument because it assumes, at least in practice, that the New Testament alone is the sole canon for Christian practice, okay? The J.V. Fesco, he said this. He said, those who appeal to Scripture alone in their arguments against infant baptism often build their case solely from the New Testament, okay? But again, that position forgets that the Bible, you know, the apostles knew the Old Testament. That was their Bible. They didn't have pocket New Testaments, okay? So as a matter of methodology, we have demonstrated through the use of biblical theology that the initiation sign of the covenant of grace has a canonical history with a, what we called a diachronical development. That is, it's something that develops throughout time and across time, not just at one particular point 
in time. Okay, in other words, if we ask only the synchronic question, right, the specific point in time uh, of what the Bible says about baptism, you're not going to immediately begin with the promise contained um, in you're not going to immediately be driven back to the Old Testament, all right? If you do a word study on baptism, I mean, the baptism is used first in the New Testament, right? And so, they, oh, that means it's not in the Old Testament, therefore, it's not important. Well, that's the wrong way to use a word study, okay? We have to build our doctrines on the whole canon of Scripture, okay? It's been the burden of this study thus far to demonstrate the unity of the Bible through the covenants, and this includes the unity of the sign of the covenant, okay? So, uh, uh, J.B. Fesco, he says, baptism must not be explained in a canonical, or must be explained, I'm sorry, in a canonical fashion, not by appealing only to the New Testament, but to the whole of Scripture, at the same time, it's necessary to account for the context in which revelation about baptism comes to the church. It is especially important to recognize the connection between baptism and covenant, as well as the antecedents of baptism, that is circumcision, in the covenant history. Okay? So that is to say, baptism doesn't begin in the New Testament. It begins with Abraham. Okay? If we're going to look at it that way, the sign. All right? Now... That being said, there is a perfectly good reason why you don't see the practice of infants uh, in the New Testament, right? This is Herman Bobbing. He says this, This fact can be explained by saying that in the days of the New Testament, the baptism of adults was the rule and the baptism of infants was the exception. It was the period in which the Christian church had been founded and expanded by conversion from Judaism and paganism. So it is precisely that transition that is depicted in baptism. Adult baptism is therefore the original baptism, and infant baptism is derivative. That is, well, what is he saying? Okay, and, and uh, Louis Burkhoff agrees here. He's, uh, Louis Burkhoff says, the, de the absence of all definite references to infant baptism finds its explanation, at least to a large extent, in the fact that the scripture gives us a historical record of the missionary work of the apostles, but no such record of the work that was carried on in the organized churches, okay? That is, the book of Acts especially, okay? It's a record of the initial expansion of the church. It's not the record of one particular church when that we know once they set elders, okay, now we've got elders. Now what are we going to do on Monday? And what are we going to do on Tuesday? And what are we going to do on Wednesday? It, it wasn't that kind of record, okay? The New Testament is not giving that kind of information. Again, that's kind of presupposing that the Bible is an exhaustive compendium of everything, okay? I mean, we, you know, we, we don't believe that about, uh, uh, about the Bible. It's not an encyclopedia, right? It's God's communication. It reveals what he wants us to know about certain things. So there's details, right? I mean, just, we don't know that they're not there, okay? Now, um, that being said, it, at least, you know, this still convinces me. There doesn't need to be an explicit verse, okay? Because, again, what do we point to? We point to the organic unity of the covenant. How, in a sense, we kind of, if we put ourselves in, in the early church, and, okay, I've converted. You know, I've come out of, let's say, uh, I've come out of one of, the, uh, one of the cults of Rome, and I've been baptized, and I've been converted, but now I have my family with me. You know, I'm expecting a child, and I don't want to raise that child according, you know, to, to the Roman pagan, uh, uh, you know, cults that I was in. I want to raise them in a Christian sort of way. So now, how does that work? And the church kind of had to deal with that. And what I'm arguing is that the church basically went from the Old Covenant, from the Old Testament scriptures that they had. They said, well, how did the people of God do it then? Let's do it that way. Okay? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to end with that. Um, but also, the, the, uh, real quick, the Baptists, again, they kind of prove too much, right? They kind of prove too much. Well, in asking for an explicit verse, well, where's the explicit verse that says to worship on Sunday? There is no verse that says worship on Sunday. Rather, the way that we come to that conclusion is because of what has happened in redemptive history, right? The resurrection changed how Christians understand the Sabbath because we no longer look, in one sense, we're, not, we're no longer looking to uh, forward to rest, we look back at a rest that's been accomplished in Christ. And of course, you know, Joshua or, or Hebrews argues that we're still looking forward. We have, we're not there completely yet, right? Which is why we still practice the Sabbath, uh, you know, but not the same as the Jews. But there's already, in a sense, been an accomplished rest that Christ gives. But there's not a text that tells you that, okay? In a sense, we use redemptive reasoning, I guess if you want to put it that way, 
to how we make that jump, right? It's the same thing for the Trinity. Do we have an explicit verse for the Trinity? No. Does that mean the Trinity is not taught in the Bible? No, okay? It means that we take what all of Scripture says about God and we put it together. It's the same argument here, okay? Um, unfortunately, I'm out of time for questions and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, hopefully you guys do get to see uh, infant baptism does have a biblical basis. It's not just leftover Roman Catholicism. It's simply an expression of the covenant dealings that God has always had with his covenant people. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Lord of the covenant, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to your people, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you um, Lord, really, that you, you do not just uh, look at individuals, Lord, but you have a bigger picture, Lord. You have the family in mind, Lord. Uh, you have nations in mind. You have all of creation in mind, Lord, in your plan of redemption. Lord, help us uh, to use the signs and the seals of the covenant that you give, Lord, uh, in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Help us to use those things um, to honor you, Lord, to, to recommit ourselves to you and, and to look at the work that you've done, the, the accomplished work that Christ did on the cross in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection, and even in his reign right now, Lord. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.